Zombies Ate My Neighbors was, um, when we set out to make this game, it was, it's really sort of in the vein of the old classic arcade games. You want to go through different levels and progress, and we wanted you to be earning points and extra lives. We wanted it to be fast action. You're always running around and shooting stuff. So in a lot of ways, the game was sort of an homage to all the classic arcade games that we had grown up with. This was our chance to have something at home that, that we could, if we were in the arcade, we would be pumping quarters into this thing to see how far it could go. It's a type of game that we succeed in doing that most people don't ever see the end of this game because it is so long. But that's what we wanted. We wanted to know that anytime I sat down, I can just play this game and go forever. So it, in many ways, it is, it is an arcade game on a console. Zombies was, was really a passion project for me. Uh, you know, as a game designer, you always have a bunch of different games that you want to make. This was a game that we had thought about a lot when working on other games. This concept of a uh, kind of kids versus monsters adventure game with a lot of gameplay. We really want, we like, we like games that would never end, essentially. We wanted to play these games for hours. When we got the chance to build this game, we set out to build a tool set that would allow us to generate lots of levels very quickly. Uh, hence the 56 levels in the game. Lots of hidden levels, trying to get, create as much variety as possible in the levels. One of our goals was to have the first 20 levels of the game just feel completely different. Each one of them was going to be sort of themed after a, a type of monster movie you might have seen. That was really our goal for the entire the project, as we want this to be unique and a, a, just a long-lasting experience for the player. When we started on Zombies, it didn't really have a story. We were big fans of games like Robotron and the old classic arcade games that were just many levels of adventure. When we signed up to work with Konami on publishing it, they requested a story for the game. In the end, it was, it was supposed to be that all these monsters were coming from Dr. Tongue. He was creating them in his lab and sort of unleashing them upon the world. Essentially, we it was a story of Kids versus monsters. There wasn't there wasn't a big overarching narrative to the thing. Early on, when I was working on X Wing, doing some UI work, I had access to a little scripting language to let me do some some just graphical experiments. For us, we knew we wanted it to be a game about kids versus all sorts of monsters. So we had to get legal approval to see how far we could go with parodies of different monster movies. You'll, you'll see all the different levels are kind of parodies of famous monster movies. That was pretty much our, our starting point. We built about 36 levels of the game, and that was a pretty long experience. When we went out and signed a contract with Konami, it took a, a few months to get everything finalized, the legals aspect and we had those months just sitting around so we made about 20 more levels to the game. We added a few things that Konami wanted like the Dr. Tongue finale and stuff. We hid away some some extra little secret things like there's a flamethrower hidden on one level of the game. So it was, it was kind of a, a nice relaxed pace. We had plenty of time to put in all the little extra things that we wanted to put into it. At the time we built zombies. It was supposed to be a resource management game. You're kind of managing the resources of your squirt guns full of holy water and your, your crazy silverware that you throw at werewolves and all the different weapons that the kids are going to use to fight the monsters. If you really want to succeed in the game, you need to save those resources early on so that you'll have them later in the game because we, we start to give you a lot less as you play forward. You also have to manage the resources of your neighbors. If you run out of neighbors, the game ends. And I don't think people had really been doing this sort of double resource management type game, and it was sort of a new experience for players. There's a lot of levels, I have to plan ahead. You'll see some people try to play the game keeping just one neighbor alive, which will allow them to complete the levels rather rapidly, but they're always kind of skirting the edge that if that last neighbor dies, the game ends for them. So there are a couple different ways you could play it. If you, wanna, if you just want to get through the game, you could be very conservative with your weapons, try to keep all 10 neighbors alive. It'll take you much longer to finish the game but you're more likely to reach the end. So I think that sort of resource management style games were, were kind of neat at that time and different, and the different ways you could play it. We also try to give lots of little hidden things so that replays were, were quite fun. You'd always find another, another hidden level or hidden weapon. 
The greatest challenge we faced in zombie development was probably keeping the game fresh. We really worked hard on like the first 20 levels of the game. We wanted kids just to think, oh, this game has always got something new in it that I've never seen before. We spent a lot of time testing it with kids. We tuned it so that we knew your first time player might only go through about eh, six, seven levels. They'd see a lot of new stuff and then as they got better, they'd play and see more new levels. After about 20 levels in, you're going to start seeing repeating themes to the levels. But that first 20 levels is really important to get people excited about the game. Another aspect of the game that was a great challenge was we, we really wanted the game to be split screen when we first developed it. And when we couldn't achieve that on the Super Nintendo, we had to come up with a solution to the multiplayer gameplay. How to keep the two players stuck on the screen and they couldn't split apart but still keep it fun. Hence, you'll see a lot of places in the game where there's trampolines so people can bounce over walls. Some of the levels were designed to let players stretch that boundary as far as possible, but not get trapped. So they could both be running down separate hallways side by side. So the, the two player aspect was a big challenge. I think we succeeded pretty well. No one really complained that they didn't have split screen. But if I, if I had the ability to go back and do it again or better hardware, I would have loved to make it split screen. This was my first chance to do an original game that I really wanted to do. So there was a lot of passion there, a lot of excitement. We had a small team. We were kind of an experimental project because we didn't have a publisher. LucasArts knew they wanted to be in the cartridge game development, but didn't know who was gonna actually put this thing out. I was working with uh, Dean Sharp, who was a great programmer, and uh, Tony Shea, who did a lot of our AI stuff. And we all just sat around, played the game ourselves. Always multiplayer, really hands-on, making sure that this was this is the fun game that we wanted to make. So for us, it was it was it was a very special moment. You don't get that chance to just do anything you want to do that often. I don't think we expected the game to be as well received as it was. We didn't have a publisher when we had about 36 levels of the game done and we had uh, a boss that was like a giant spider that you fight. It wasn't a particularly great ending of the game. We went off to the Consumer Electronics Show and we just put the, the game on the floor and just let people play it. And Dean and I stood in front of it all day and demoed it and showed people how it worked and mentioned that it didn't have a publisher. So various publishers just came by and they were really amazed to see the product and we're even more amazed that nobody was putting this product out. So that allowed LucasArts to kind of get a nice lineup of different publishers all wanting to offer money to put this game out. We eventually settled on uh, Konami and they were a great partner for that. They, they added some additional features and things they wanted to see and we all respected Konami products quite a bit. It then went out and sold quite, quite a lot more units than I expected. And I, I never expected it to become sort of this little cult hit that people still talk about years later. <laughs> when we were building uh, Zombies and Ate My Neighbors, there was really two platforms for it. There was the uh, Sega Genesis and the uh, Super Nintendo. Both of them had completely different limitations on them. The Super Nintendo, though I think it had a better color palette, had a lot of restrictions on how many various objects could appear on a scan line of the TV set. So we, we ended up having to cut back the number of monsters sometimes. We had that much more lush palette, but there were, I think there were fewer characters that we could use. The, the world was built up of little tiny square pieces of art, and there were fewer number of those squares available on the Super Nintendo. Having to build it for the two different systems simultaneously made us make some hard choices for each system. People don't really realize that. They would just think, oh, you just port it right over. But every system's a little different. And if you want it to run as well as possible, you, you kind of build it to work on both systems. I'm really surprised when I go places and see people have played Zombie Ape My Neighbors. I've uh, had people sitting there like, oh, you made Zombies Ape My Neighbors. Uh, I was playing that was like five years old. <laughs> I'm glad that it's been a special game to so many people. I really enjoyed making it. I hope that, that people enjoy playing it still. Mm -hmm.